Greetings from the Philippines to the world. It's September 15, 5.05 p.m. here in Manila. And we are on Facebook Live on Eagle News. And also watch this video on eaglenewslive.com. I am Cesar Vallejos. We are open for business. Join me, discover the latest news and information in business around the world. Stay ahead of the curve from vision to action. The peso is 53.94 against the dollar. And at the closing of trade yesterday, the Philippine Stock Exchange Index closed at 7,413.15, down 104.22 points or 1.39%. Big corporations started as small businesses. A famed global franchise started out of the front room of a local gas station where the founder single-handedly worked as the station operator, chief cook, and cashier. And another one came up with its name because its first location was in a building whose signage was too small to accommodate anything longer than nine letters. And there are many other uh, stories how small businesses grew to become the world's famous global brands. In the local scene, we have witnessed how big brands successfully transitioned from mom and pop shop to streamlined franchise operation. How exactly does one make such a big jump? Later on this afternoon, we will know the insights of one of the country's fast rising franchise names in the food industry. Before we talk with Joey Garcia, the executive vice president and the brand director of the Rai Rai Ken Group. Let's take a look at this business stories we've seen published this week. Peso falls below 54 against the dollar. EO drafted to fight inflation. Jollibee to put up stores in United Kingdom, New York, and Macau. Apple unveils three new iPhones. And here are the details. The value of the peso dropped past 54 to a dollar on Wednesday, the lowest in almost 13 years. A sentiment towards the currency remained bearish due to an ongoing route against emerging market, market currencies and a stubbornly high local inflation rate. On the foreign exchange market, the peso ended the trading session as, at 54.13 to a dollar, which was less than three centavo off the low of 54.15 set on December 2, 2005. Wednesday's drop came despite the decision of the central bank to reactivate a dollar hedging mechanism introduced during the 1997 East Asian financial crisis. The peso's weakness is expected to persist until next year, given a widening current account deficit coupled with a wider budget deficit cap, London-based Oxford Economics said. The Economic Development Cluster will submit to the Office of the President a draft executive removing the administrative constraints and non-tariff barriers on the importation of fish, rice, sugar, meat, and vegetables, Malacanang said. Presidential spokesman Harry Roque Jr. said in a palace briefing on Wednesday that this would mean that the draft order meant, meant simplifying the process of food importation. The EDC last week unveiled measures to ease high food prices after August inflation surged to a nine-year high of 6.4%, bringing the year-to-date inflation at 4.8%. The August inflation is beyond the upper end of central bank's forecast range of 55 to 6.2%. According to Roque, among the short-term policy recommendations listed by EDC include the release of 4.6 sacks of rice available in warehouses of the National Food Authority to the market across the country and allocation of 2.7 million sacks of rice to Zamboanga, Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi. Local fast food giant Jollibee Foods Corporation said it is set to open its first flagship Jollibee stores in three different milestone locations, the United Kingdom, Manhattan in the U.S., and Macau in China, as part of its global expansion plans. The company said that the expansion is part of the company's plan to even out the share of domestic 
to international sales. The first Jollibee store in the UK will have its grand opening on October 20. A few weeks before that, the Macau branch will hold its grand opening on September 28. In 2013, Jollibee became the number one restaurant company in Asia in terms of market capitalization and is now the world's largest Asian restaurant company. The fast food giant is now aiming to be among the top five largest restaurant companies in the world in terms of market capitalization. Apple unveiled three new iPhones on Wednesday, including its biggest and most expensive model yet, as the company seeks to widen the product's appeal and amid slowing sales. CEO Tim Cook showed off the iPhone XS Max or XS Max, which is a bigger screen than the one on last year's dramatically designed model, the iPhone X. It will cost about $1,100. An updated iPhone X now called the 10s stays at 1000 US dollars. As with the iPhone 10, both new phones have screens that run from edge to edge, an effort to maximize the display without making the phone too awkward to hold. The Max model looks to be about the size of the iPhone 8 Plus, though the screen size is much larger. The iPhone XS Max, which will be available on September 21 with orders open the week before, repre represents Apple's attempt to feed consumers' appetite for increasingly larger screens as they rely on smartphones to watch and record video and to take photos wherever they are. Apple also showed off a cheaper iPhone called the iPhone 10R that costs roughly $750 and will be available in the U.S. on October 26. All three new models joined the iPhone 10 in getting rid of the home button to make room for more screen. They will have facial recognition technology to unlock the device. Later on, when we get back, Joey Garcia, the executive vice president and brand director of Rai Rai Ken Group, will be joining Open for Business. Stay tuned. for business and you've seen the impressive credentials of our guest Mr. Joey Garcia of Rai Raiken. Thank you very Thank much you. for, you for coming me. on a stormy day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Quite an experience. Okay. Uh we our our discussion uh would go into in how we establish a franchise business but um we we before we go into that I know for a fact that uh your family and you personally, and even your father, Especially. you know, has been in um, started doing a mom and pop uh, business before, you know, you established your company into one of the most uh, recognizable brands in the country. Can you s tell us your story? How you began? Actually, um, the business started uh, when my father used to work in a small. Uh, Japanese restaurant back in the 70s. Okay. Back in the 70s, he was working in a small Japanese restaurant mm -hmm. in Mabini. Uh, I wouldn't mention the name, but okay. uh, it was the start. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the boss, his former boss, is a, a Japanese guy mm -hmm. who decided to bring him to, to Japan to study culinary. Mm -hmm. Then upon coming back to the Philippines, he was tasked to train other Japanese um, national to be showcased in a kitchen. Before, before a Japanese restaurant to be called authentic, uh, the, the, the chef should be a 
a Japanese. Okay. So little that we know that those Japanese are being trained by my dad. So oh. he comes back and back and forth to to Japan to study culinary. But how how were they able to know your dad from the beginning? The, uh, you, your actually, dad really, really no no. Actually, my dad started as a dishwasher in the restaurant. Oh, oh he was I so see. passionate about about cooking. So because he was already in the kitchen, he saw how the the process and the the styles of mm. uh, how how to cook. And then until eventually the boss recognized his passion in mm -hmm. cooking, so mm -hmm. he was sent to Japan. Upon coming back, he was tasked to train other Japanese national. So initially, mm -hmm. he was self-taught. You know. Yes, yes, he was self-taught in the beginning. Oh, I see. And then uh, the boss recognized his passion and talent, and then he was uh, uh, sent to Japan to study the formal culinary uh, schooling. So upon coming back, he was assigned to do the sauces, the noodles, oh, okay. and other uh, specially uh, special skills in maki. All sorts of Japanese um, style of cooking, and then eventually um, he stayed in that company for about twenty years mm -hmm. until his bosses, uh, his boss died. He okay. then when the boss passed away, um, he decided to put up his first venture into business, okay. and he started a small carinderia in Bautista in Makati that was in nineteen ninety two. Okay. And and you mm. don't even you know you called it karindir yeah how yeah. do you describe how do you describe a karindir um, yeah versus uh, you know a restaurant or a actually it's, it's it's canteen it's very funny because um we are uh, he he is he's so fond of cooking mm -hmm. so he really wanted to put up at first a, a Japanese restaurant okay but he doesn't he doesn't mm -hmm. have any capital okay. so we decided to put up a karindir instead okay. and then we're offering tapsilog. Oh. But there's, uh, I think that's a confluence. During that time, our karinderia is uh, sitting beside most of the karaoke or nightclub, wherein there's a lot of Japanese customers. Oh. So uh, at the wee time of the day, those Japanese are looking for uh, a place who, who, uh, where they could uh, spend a ramen or yeah, and or something ramen. very very authentic. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So my dad thought that why should I? offer ramen mm -hmm. in that small karinderia that we have back in the 90s. So one of the regular customers, Mr. Naomi Fukuda, he was so ecstatic because why could a, a, a small karinderia with the name, the, the name is so funny, it's Master Chow. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. And then we can offer authentic ramen during the wee time. Okay. So that regular, customers, uh, that, that regular customer approached my dad, why don't you convert this Karinderia into a full-fledged Japanese restaurant. Mm, so okay. uh, that Japanese guy get a piece of paper and then wrote a name. He wrote Rai Rai Ken. Which means? And that my, my dad simply exclaimed, I don't even like this name. <laughs> <laughs> so we really doesn't know what's the meaning of Rai Rai Ken then. Okay. So, so it was the Japanese guy, the customer. Yes, that customer, the, the regular customer, customer who named gave, it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Gave, gave the name. So after a few years, that's the moment I, I researched what is the real meaning of our brand. Okay. So uh, upon my research, ramen or noodles mm -hmm. uh, originally came from China, okay. which is pronounced Lai Lomien. Lomien. So the, the Japanese cannot pronounce Lomien, they pronounce it as ramen. Oh, oh I so that's see. the story. So, so from Lomien, Lomien to it became ramen. ramen. So in 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 Japan, the first um, Rai Rai Ken was called Lai Lai Ken. Okay, it's L A I L A I. Yes. So the Japanese again cannot pronounce exactly Lomien, ah, yes. Lai Lai Ken. So they okay. pronounce it as Rai Rai Ken. So and the rest, <laughs> and the rest was history. Okay, so. Uh, what were the challenges challenges when you were starting? So we know that um, as a mom and pop business, these are the you know the small ones that um, are family owned, run. And how can you know what's the story behind that transformation from a very small um, a business? And most of them, or most of you, are of course family yes, uh, yes, members. Yes. What's the story of the transformation from that uh, um, store to what is now uh, a chain of restaurants? Actually, when we are starting, my dad used to be the chef or the cook. Okay. He managed the kitchen while my, my mom is part of the uh, store operations. Okay. And even before, I was part of the marketing. Mm -hmm. 
mm. because there's a lot of um, menu or recipe that we have to write in Japanese. Wow. And we don't have any Japanese um, employee back then. So I had to literally copy the Japanese font uh, <laughs> and write it as if I, I, I could understand, I could ah, write it uh, properly. And then um, it's quite interesting because the main reason of my dad before is just to survive. Mm-hmm. Because uh, coming from being an employee for 20 plus years and mm-hmm. my mom, uh, we don't have any background in business. Mm-hmm. It's a very simple mom and pop operation. Okay. What we needed is to buy raw materials from the wet market mm-hmm. and then prepare it in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And during the during lunchtime, we have to open the store. Mm-hmm. Our menu is a kind of ordinary because it was, it was not even typewritten before. Mm-hmm. It was uh, handwritten by... By me, mm-hmm. so I, I literally had to to copy those uh, Japanese font, and then um, it's quite interesting because um, it's the the day to day operation that makes us um, professional to our craft. Okay. Um, but but you said Joey, um, you don't have a business background. You know, you don't have that much capital. Yes, yes. So as uh, you know, just if, for for people, especially for entrepreneurs who are listening, what is it that you have? That that you that uh, that has to that are uh, you uh, that you were banking on to to ensure that the business will go on. Um, there was this one time that uh, our business is growing really fast, and then eventually when because during that time our main customers are the Japanese. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, we only have at least five to ten percent of Filipino clientele. Mm-hmm. We only oh. serve ninety five percent of the Japanese market. Wow. Our store then are in Makati, in Kamagong, and one in, in Quezon City. So if uh, until the Asian financial crisis when the Japanese left our country, we were forced to adjust our business and to modify it. I that was the see. time when I was uh, back in college that I had to ask my dad, would you allow me to do a version of your restaurant mm-hmm. my way? Okay. Uh, that's the. That's so his the, way was really <laughs> his way was really the authentic. Japanese yes, it's the one. real authentic okay. because we're serving ninety five percent of Japanese uh, clientele. Yeah. So in short, Joey, it's it's the the presence of a market that is yes, very. Uh, a, the uh, uh, yeah, you were saying mm-hmm. that you know the, yes, the driving yeah, force mm-hmm. was the presence of the market, and then when they left, you now you had you know this idea to shift gears yes, because you have to serve. Another the, or to to you know to keep it going. Yes, definitely. And if if your market left, what is it to yes. do? So what uh, now that you, what was what was your father's response when you asked uh, him uh, to do it your own? I way? remember the way I, I told him, uh, Daddy, can you allow me to open my version of Rai Rai Because we have to implement such as integrated marketing communication. Well, uh, yeah, the big words, words. Yes, three hundred sixty. Uh, my my my, my dad simply told me, uh, reply that, whatever do you need to, to do, uh, just do it. Oh, Simply like wow. that. So with that opportunity, I hired my, my new set of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I hired the first professional manager that we have in our business. When you say first professional manager, you're not referring to your wife, John. No, no. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> because because then, our branches used to be managed by my tita, my titos, oh, by, the, um, by the yayas. Okay. Uh, so, it's a typical mom and pop operation. Well, well, as, as I learned in the last week's uh, episode, you know, uh, it, it, you should normally start with the three Fs. Uh, <laughs> yes, family, the family, friends, friends and, and the fools. Yeah. Uh, okay. So... <laughs> This happens. Yes, really, really okay. because we don't have any capital to to give the the, the proper salary. Mm-hmm. So with with my case, I told my dad. Okay. I told right. my dad to to um, hire a professional manager. So uh, I hired my first pro- professional manager. I hired um, um, professional service crew, mm-hmm. and then at, I hired the first architect who would design our store. Oh, I see. So. Um, Shifting, going from a uh, from a mom and pop business, but you know, w- what did you do first? Was there a specific manual, or did you enroll yourself into yes. an entrepreneurial actually uh, course? You know, how did you professionalize? Uh, it? During that time, when I was suggesting to my dad that I had to do this, um, I, I consulted one of my professor back in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was he asked me, "What business are you in?" 
and I told them uh, we are into restaurant. Mm-hmm. And then I brought my professor to my restaurant, and he was surprised. Joey, I, ca- I couldn't even call this a restaurant. <laughs> so back then, I had to literally attend myself to several courses, crash courses. Um, for example, I had to attend the management course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to take my uh, little MBAs or any courses that are available that could could help me uh, build my skills and my 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 reputation as a restaurateur. Mm-hmm. Because back then I don't know how to to cook, but I know how to cook concept. That's what I'm wow. really telling my 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 family and my dad. Okay, hold on okay. there, uh, Joey. From uh, cooking to cooking concepts, so let's uh, hear more about Joey Garcia, the Executive Vice President and Brand Director of Fry Rai Ken, when open for business returns. Stay tuned. back and we're open for business. Uh, with us is Mr. Joey Garcia, the Executive Vice President and Brand Director of the Rai Rai Ken Group. Joey, you said you don't know how to cook, but you can cook concepts. Yes, so in cooking concepts, of course, that involves uh, the, the art and science yes, of yes, yes. branding and brand development. So in doing that, can you describe your your ways in in terms of cooking up concepts? What is your exercise in the branding development and conceptualization? Um, back then, when I'm doing our brand, mm-hmm. um, it's very simple. The usual product, price, place, and promo okay. before. Because my idea then is, it, since the Japanese left out, left out of the country, mm-hmm. and I had to market our brand to the new market, mm-hmm. so I started with price. Okay. Because the price before of, of our product are too expensive mm-hmm. and designed for the Japanese clientele. Correct. So I had to literally cut the prices into half. Wow. So that's what I did. And how, mm. and how did the competition react? Actually, during that time, the good thing about it is there are very, very less competition. Oh. It was only the known brand of yesteryears are available. Really? But, uh, yes, yes. So what I did is I, I literally cut the price into half but without sacrificing the quality mm-hmm. or the, the style of my dad of serving authentic Japanese tasting food. Okay. But I told my dad, you have to adjust the product in the, in the sense that you have to adapt to the uh, Filipino palate because mm-hmm. we love sweet, we, love, we don't like the authentic tasting Japanese which is very sour. I so see. we had to literally adjust. So, yeah, but, but yeah, mm-hmm. but when you do the adjust, adjustment, so... Is there some sort of a formal market test, like say, a food <laughs> During test? that time, during that time, actually, it was all my idea. I even asked my friends oh, to, to try this food. Oh, okay. um, this is the authentic tasting uh, version, and this is my, my, my type. Okay. So I just literally called my friends or, and even my sisters and my uh-huh. siblings to try it. And then uh, product price and the place. Mm-hmm. Before, we wanted to be, uh, si- uh, to be located side by side by... Uh, the nightclubs because of the Japanese. Correct. So I had to ask around different mall operators to give us a space. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, during that time, those big brands of malls, I wouldn't mention their name, okay. they wouldn't get us because b- b- before they referring to us as, we don't want you because you're just a simple mommy house. Mommy or oh, a noodle house. I see. So it was very... Uh, what do you call this? It's very hard on my part to be called a mommy house. So what mm-hmm. I did is I asked one of the owner of Harrison Plaza Village Square, okay. Mom Irene Francisco, Martel Francisco, and I presented to her my new concept of Rai Rai Ken. Okay. And then she told me, are you sure? Are you the, the son of Mr. Garcia from, from that <laughs> known restaurant in, in, Baut, uh, in, in Mabini? Yes, uh, I'll get you. Wow, instantaneously, she gave ah. me that space in Village Square, a very prime space. 15 years ago. Okay. So he gave and that was your? My uh, first version your, of, okay. of our brand. So, mm-hmm. it literally, it's a very good-looking store. 
I even commissioned a designer for my furniture from Pampanga, mm -hmm. and it, my my store looks very uh, it's authentic and modern at the same time. So mm -hmm. totally, it's a new version of what we had uh, several years back. And surprisingly, mm -hmm. Joey, no uh, Japanese is involved in the board yes, or in the. Yes. Okay, so I had to literally study a lot of things from product, price, place, and even the promotion that I did mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. then. But are mm -hmm. you getting uh, insights from Japanese nationals? Like, do you have uh, you know regular friends, or do you have a mentor, or do you have you know? Japanese? Actually, uh, actually, my dad he has a Japanese friend, the one who gave the name to us. I see. Yes. So see. because there's a two perspective, a different mm -hmm. uh, different perspective from the the Japanese, from my dad, and from me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm I'm just telling them that this is the the feel of the market. This is this is this is what my gut is telling me okay. that I had to do this price place promo and and packaging. Correct. So I had to literally repackage the brand, uh, set a different uh, positioning. So mm -hmm. since I'm a marketing graduate, so I had a little experience about about branding and positioning. Mm -hmm. So I was very hopeful that my new concept would would work. Mm -hmm. And then in the first uh, opening day, it was September 13 of 2004, mm -hmm. we were so surprised with the tremendous success of the restaurant. During back that time, my sales around 50 or 70,000 a day. That was 14, 15 years ago. Wow. So I literally grow our business from six store back then. Six stores too. Plus 15 stores the following year. Wow. of that new version of of our brand so it's more than double yeah in a year yeah so and from how many stores do you have now uh now i have 60 stores with different brands wow <laughs> so it's not only the rai rai Khan group but other yes uh, i have so. other brands and okay. a hotel uh, wow a hotel brand and that's a, an entirely different industry again yes 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 okay now uh Going back to this, um, putting up of various uh, um, brands and putting it up in different parts of the country, uh, we now have to really talk about uh, franchising. If I were a businessman or an entrepreneur who wants to establish a franchise, what would be the top, let's say, top five questions that I should ask uh, a franchise? If you're a franchise or a franchisor? Uh, I am of the businessman. Okay, I'm you're the franchisee. the franchisee. Okay, okay. Yes. What are what are the top questions that I should ask a franchisor? Okay. So that I would make sure that you know my my investment would be worth yes. it. Yes, and you and can that, replicate the, the success. Exactly. So mm -hmm. what would be the main questions that I would ask a franchisor? I, I think number one, if I'm a franchisee and to get a franchise, uh, number one um, consideration that I had to check is the the. Um, what do you call this? The reputation of the the, the person who owns okay. the brand, okay. and the reputation of the brand, okay. Because it's two uh, two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the brand itself has its own equity, and even the owners of the brand, okay. the people who manage the brand. Because mm -hmm. uh, in our times now, there are a lot of franchising business. Now they could easily develop the concept yes. and. Once the concept pops up of their head, they really wanted to duplicate the business exactly. without knowing, uh, without establishing the back end, mm -hmm. the support system, mm -hmm. and the equity of the brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because brand is a, it's like a person. Mm -hmm. It has, uh, it, it should have a story, mm -hmm. and it should have a, a product. Uh, it should have a, a, a support system yes. within the business system. So if you are going to to franchise a concept, an idea, mm -hmm. or a business. You should look into to okay. these two important so things. So the, the reputation of the owners yes. and the reputation of the brand, the brand itself. itself. Okay, what mm. else would I look for? Um, you have to check the existing branches. Okay. You can shop around. <laughs> you can shop around. Okay. Um, um, for example, my, my initial franchisee before, uh, they are regular customers of mine. Oh, okay. Those initial 10 or 15 in that year, are my regular customers in mm -hmm. that business model restaurant mm -hmm. in that Harrison Plaza Village Square. Most of them are regular guests who comes and go to, to, to my mm -hmm. restaurant. And they really wanted to... They Actually, they're the one who convinced me to grant them a franchise. 
Wow. Because back then, I don't have a franchise system. Exactly. I don't even have a franchise agreement. Uh -huh. I don't have a franchise mm -hmm. background. I really don't know even the term franchising before. <laughs> it was wow. uh, uh, a new term for me. I so how could I could allow anyone to open a branch like me mm -hmm. if I don't know how to do it? I see. So, so this is a story of a, a brand, you know, that... Uh, tried to uh, transform itself to yes, be yes, a very, yes. very good material to be franchised. Yes, franchisable. Franchisable. Mm -hmm. yes, so yes. is there a formula for this? Yes, actually there is. I see. Yes, because you have to ask your, yourself, if I'm the franchisor, I'm the franchisor, I had to ask myself if my product is duplicable, okay. my concept is duplicable, mm -hmm. is my product um, can be... Um, there should a, a portion of your, your concept or your product should be retained to you as a uh, formula or what they call this a uh, trademark. Okay. Uh, a secret formula for the for the likes of mm -hmm. the soft drinks. Mm -hmm. They could they could sell soft drinks all throughout the world, but they retain that certain percentage of uh, um, the formula mm -hmm. of the product that only they could mm -hmm. they could uh, give to to franchisee. For the example, for mm -hmm. in food, um, all the sauces mm -hmm. comes from me. I see. The noodles comes from me. Do you also do patents for that? We or? we we, oh, we have patent. to have. I see. So if you hire uh, cooks, they, they could cook the same ramen, bento, donburi, etc. But they couldn't copy the, the sauces. Okay. Mm -hmm. T talking about that formula, um, we are saying that because you are a Japanese brand, it's somehow very, it, it needs a special skill to yes. prepare it. How is your training to the franchises? The, what's the system like? Because yours is not just the typical yes, uh, yes, food yes, that yes, you yes, have yes. to easily prepare and serve. It has to somehow be uh, still uh, be um, authentic in terms of the Japanese taste that caters also, as you mentioned, to the Filipino yes. palate. So, what, how do you train your your uh, franchise uh, franchisees, and then? Uh, what's the system that you do to make sure that you know their needs are always um, provided? And uh, yeah, good thing about the company is um, my dad is a chef. Okay. So he could easily train his um, his warriors, as we call it. Okay. Um, those uh, chefs are being trained by my father, mm -hmm. and they're being assigned to different um, uh, regions. Okay. For example, there's North Luzon, South Luzon. Uh, there's the Visayas so the, the store is already in the, the, the three uh, major islands? Yes, 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 okay. yes, all throughout the, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So there's this um, training that my, my dad develops for, okay. for his um, chef. So those chefs are regularly being updated by, by, by my father um, to, uh, to the proper, we call it PIP, mm -hmm. Procedure, mm -hmm. Ingredients, Presentation. Mm -hmm. So those three barriers in terms of food preparation must be followed accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then we have this system of in operations that we regularly check all our branches unannounced. Okay. So we so have it's really a spot um, check. Of yes, the spot system. checking. Uh, even through our, through through our friends, we could easily. Hey, can you can you visit my store in in Bohol, in Pampanga, <laughs> in 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 uh, several Visayas branches? So it's very easy to to check. I nowadays, see. nowadays, especially there's the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, customer complaints can easily be exactly. reviewed. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, uh, what about the most common mistakes or failures of uh, franchises, especially the ones who are entering into, you know, for mm -hmm. the new ones? Mm -hmm. So, in your you have your um, a success story and definitely in your case you have a lot of failures as well definitely. and mistakes what do you think uh, should be avoided by the new uh, franchise uh, batches of franchises actually the the, the the common mistake of the franchisees is that as if if they get the franchise it's it became an instant success mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work like that okay. because it is a relationship between the franchise or in the franchisee that the franchisee should be hands-on onto their store. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even us, uh, we have uh, around 50 company-owned uh, company store. We have developed this system of monitoring. Mm -hmm. So if you are a franchisee who would operate a one, one is to one store, mm -hmm. so you have to really spend time to, mm -hmm. because we have this um, course that the franchisee would be immersed into our own stores Right. And he should, or he or she should manage our own stores for about two to three months. 
So oh, he okay. would he or she would master the store operations. So there's a mm. level of uh, hand holding. Definitely. In, in your in your case, how what's the percentage of the company owned versus the ones are that are? Uh, 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 right uh, now, it's about um, more than seventy percent are company owned. Okay. Thirty percent are franchise. Why? Because there is this, there's this um, time that we had to literally go back to our support system mm -hmm. that we have to uh, make it more efficient so mm -hmm. we could sell new franchisee. I because see. not only the main brand, uh, Rai Raiken, uh, would be into franchising. Mm -hmm. We will develop several new brands intendedly for franchising. Okay. Oh, that, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, what is it that you know we talked about the the uh, you know the, the the failures what is the success rate of uh, of these franchises uh, when i go into this uh, business uh, what in terms of the success rate and failure rate can you actually in, 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 you my, in my in my recent uh, research if a person uh, who who dwells into into a business or putting up a restaurant uh, from ground, okay. meaning he doesn't get any franchise. Yes. Uh, failure rate is about 85% to 15 okay. success. So if you get a franchise, mm -hmm. it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. yes. I see. It's, it's the reverse. Why? Because the franchisor has a proven system and a proven marketability mm -hmm. of, the pr of the product and the brand. Mm -hmm. So that's, why, that's definitely the reason why franchising is a very lucrative business now. But not all franchisee uh, would be that successful if they would be they would not be trained properly by the franchisor. Mm -hmm. So the key here is the training, uh, the discipline, and uh, the transfer of technology. Mm -hmm. So if you learn those three, and the processes would be very simple, mm -hmm. and profitability could be achieved as as simple as as simply as it is. Mm. I have a lot of uh, more questions to ask, but we are running out of time. I think Joey Garcia of the Rai Raikan Group will be coming back to answer these uh, questions. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'd like to thank Joey for coming here in the studio in a stormy day. Thank, thank you, you very much, you. and we hope that um, you can come again uh, yes, so definitely. that you can uh, really talk about the other um, uh, details regar regarding how to really establish your franchise business. But before you leave, what is your advice to new entrepreneurs, to uh, to people who would want to start up uh, businesses, who are those especially those who are um, you know budding entrepreneurs who want to go into their fields of interest? So any piece of advice? Um, to them? Uh, as my father always told me, if you are going to do a business, always start with your purpose. What is your purpose for, for doing such? And then find your passion mm -hmm. because we have a lot of different passion. But mm -hmm. your passion should align to your giftedness mm -hmm. because if your passion is singing and you're not gifted to singing, and then why pursue it? So mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's always three. The, the purpose, the passion, and giftedness. Because if you pursue a, a, a passion that is you, that uh, God had blessed you with such gift or talent, and then even, even with a lot of failure, you always um, bounce back and be successful. So that's Perfect. my, my simple formula for success. Perfect. Thank you, Joey, for your inspiring words. Our term of the week and our inspiring words when Open for Business returns. Stay tuned. Open for Business will be back. Thank you. for business in our term of the week you take a refresher of business terms to make you updated more informed and ready to make smarter business decisions 
Our term of the week is mom and pop. According to Investopedia, mom and pop is a colloquial term for a small family-owned or independent business. Mom and pop also refers to inexperienced investors who play the market casually and rely on brokers to manage their portfolios. Historically, mom and pop was used to describe local general stores or drug stores, often referred, owned, and operated by a family. Today, mom and pop establishments are synonymous with different businesses types. Business types such as restaurants, local bookstores, automotive repair shops, and insurance agencies. With the help of technology and a consumer population demanding more personalized products and services, mom and pop businesses are gaining popularity. The internet helps to expand their target audience and geographical reach. We end our webisode with a quote of the day. Today's words are from Jack Ma, a Chinese business magnate, investor, and philanthropist. He is the co-founder and executive chairman of the Alibaba Group, a multinational technology conglomerate. As of August 2018, he is one of China's richest men with a net worth of 38.6 billion U.S. dollars, as well as, as well as one of the wealthiest people in the world. On September 10, 2018, he announced that he will retire from Alibaba and pursue educational charity work effective in a year with Daniel Zhang succeeding him as executive chairman. Jack said, you should learn from your competitor, but never copy. Copy and you die. Join us again next Saturday, 5 p.m. Philippine time for another episode of Open for Business where we discuss business information, deliver the latest business news to keep you informed and open for business and be ahead of the curve from vision to action. You're on Facebook Live on Eagle News and you can watch <coughs> this again in a video section of the Eagle News Facebook page and on eaglenewslive.com. Also visit postinglive.com for news and updates on Open for Business. Catch me later at 9 p.m. on Net25's Eagle News International as I report more business news here and around the world. For Open for Business, this is Cesar Vallejos. Have a great day.